we may fondly recall some of the great revivals from the past and wish a great move of God would happen again. I'm happy to say we have someone with us today who has answers. Dr. John Noe is author of A Once Mighty Faith. John, it's good to visit with you again. Hey, it's good to be with you again, Steve. Your book, A Once Mighty Faith, offers an analysis of the problem and a solution not commonly heard. Why is the church in the sorry state it's in? Today, sad to say, the central teaching of Jesus is no longer the central teaching of his church. And when I say the central teaching, I'm talking about the kingdom of God. Now, you mention a term that summarizes much of what's wrong, reduction of the gospel. What does this mean? If you ask the vast majority of evangelicals, Steve, you know, what is the gospel, about nine out of ten or even more will say it's the life, death, and resurrection of Jesus Christ, or they'll put it in a personal manner and say, when you die, you'll go to heaven instead of go to hell. Now, the problem with that is that that was not the gospel Jesus came into his earthly ministry and proclaimed for the first three years of his three-and-a-half-year ministry. His gospel was the gospel of the kingdom, and he didn't say anything that he was going to die and die for our sins so that we could go to heaven, not until the three-year point of his three-and-a-half-year ministry. So what we have done is we've taken the first three years, the gospel of the kingdom, and essentially eliminated that from the gospel. John, how can we talk about the kingdom of God without focusing solely on salvation? We have two great works of the Messiah, that of the kingdom and that of salvation. And Steve, that's the order in which Jesus proclaimed them, as I mentioned uh, previously, and that's the order in which Jesus accomplished them. So it's both and, and the gospel of salvation is encompassed within the gospel of the kingdom. But we've eliminated the kingdom and made it all about the gospel of salvation to our detriment. And we are reaping major consequences, Steve, like here in America, for example. The statistics are we're losing, for example, six to seven out of every ten of our youth raised in the church by the age of 23. Why do you think the modern church is experiencing this disconnect with the kingdom? Because our leaders have got the kingdom, the central teaching of Jesus Christ, caught up in eschatological midair. For example, the most dominant, prominent view in evangelicalism is that the kingdom Jesus was presenting back in that first century isn't even here anymore, but that it was withdrawn by God when Jews refused to receive Jesus as king and the type of kingdom he was offering, which was offensive to them, and that God withdrew it. But one of these days, any time now, we're told Jesus is going to come back and establish his kingdom over in Israel for a thousand years and start sacrificing animals again, arguably the greatest heresy in the modern-day church today. I know what you're talking about, John. I remember when I got the Schofield Reference Bible as a young Christian, and I found the footnotes about the return of animal sacrifices. Why would anybody want to go back to that after Jesus made the final sacrifice? That's what they're doing, and that's the dominant view in evangelicalism, Steve. Now, the second and third dominant views is what's called amillennialism and postmillennialism, and they believe that the kingdom Jesus was presenting was only there in some sense or in an already not yet manner. But the problem with that is that Jesus never used any such language such as that, nor did any New Testament writer. But John, your view of prophetic fulfillment makes it possible to embrace the kingdom now. Would you explain? Preterism, the word comes from the Latin praetor, meaning past. It's used in, in verb forms for uh, the preterist form of a verb, past tense, and so forth. And it means in the field of eschatology, past in fulfillment. For example, the kingdom that Jesus came bringing, that's past in fulfillment. I mean, it has happened. We don't have to sit around here and wait for him to do something over in Israel and start sacrificing those little animals again, you know, someday out in the future. And that kingdom is a kingdom that is here, available, and the only thing that is capable of turning this world upside down again. I was kind of startled when I read your definition of the greater works Jesus said we would be doing, but it may make the most sense of any explanation I've heard. Tell us about it, John. John 14, 12, Jesus told us that those who believe in me, the works that I do shall you do, and greater works than these shall you do. Now, we know what the works Jesus did were because he modeled them, but we don't know, most of us don't know what the greater works are. 
So I define them this way. The greater works are works that Jesus did not do during his earthly ministry, but they are works that God's people have been instructed to do throughout Scripture. From the very beginning in Genesis in the Old Testament to the very end in the New Testament. And I lay out all those scriptures in the book, obviously, and basically what they entail is that the greater works are worldwide societal transformations and cultural transformations via the advancing of Christ's everlasting and ever-increasing kingdom and comprehensive salvation. Yes, you do a good job of bringing up some of the Old Testament scriptures. They talk about the Jews being a blessing to the people. Of course, in the New Testament, we're supposed to be light and salt, and that way people who would not otherwise be exposed to the kingdom are. Exactly, Steve. Jesus did not do that. Jesus did not come in and turn the world upside down. What he did was came in and gave us the wherewithal for us to be able to do that. Well, John, let me tell you something. I had been listening to a podcast on the day your book arrived at my home, and the host was talking about how things were going to get worse and worse, and it's futile for Christians to think they can have any effect on society. Then your book came, and it confirmed some things that were very important for me. I've felt for a long time that uh, Christians are supposed to have an effect on society. We're supposed to affect education and government and entertainment and medicine. If we look back to Francis Schaeffer back in the 1970s, he was saying that society was going downhill because Christians had abandoned being light and salt in whatever part of society they were called to. Praise the Lord, Steve. I tell you what, if we could get that message out to Christians today and churches today, we could do that. We could, we could turn the world upside down again. John, you've given us a lot to think about. Thanks for an alternative to the gloom and doom that's usually such a big part of Bible prophecy teaching. It's been a pleasure again, Steve. Dr. John Noe is author of A Once Mighty Faith, available now online at Amazon.com. This is Steve Eastman for Wait Till You Hear This. Discover more stories like this one on our website, waittillyouhearthis.com. you hear this.com.